You are listening to Gangland Wire, hosted by former Kansas City Police Intelligence Unit Detective Gary Jenkins. Welcome, all you wiretappers out there. I'm back here in the studio of Gangland Wire. Uh, you know, uh, hit me up on Venmo once in a while. Buy me a, a cup of coffee. Help pay the expenses of the uh, podcast. I have on the Zoom call here, but you're not going to see his picture for a reason that we will go into in a minute. You're going to see actually his pic. You're seeing his picture, but you're not seeing him live. And, and there's a reason for that. We'll go into that in a minute. Uh, Chicky, I happened to see a, a little blurb on the internet about how a former, I think the headline might have been former Genovese bookie is going to be an actor in a biopic about a, a guy called Willie Pep. And, you know, I didn't really go into this big time. I just thought, I want to talk to him. I want to get him on the <laughs> show because, because what I want, I, I want to talk to him about the skills he learned, the life skills he learned being a bookie and dealing in that world. What, what he will, how he will use those to portray a mobster on screen or a bookie or, or whatever he portrays on screen. I think there's gonna be a big crossover. I think part of the time, uh, a, a good bookie is a good actor and, 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 and he's gonna use those skills he learned uh, in collecting debts and, and taking bets. And, and, and keeping betters lined up and keep new betters coming in, new action coming in. I think he's gonna use those as an actor. So folks, welcome Chicky Chickatelli. Thank, it's really great to have you here, Chicky. Thank you, Gary. Thank you to uh, your listeners and followers. Thank you for having me. I appreciate taking time out of your day to listen to this. So first of all, uh, you know, a little bit I read in that article was you were a, a bookie in the Genovese family. Is that correct? Um, yeah, that's, uh, well, yeah, allegedly, yeah, that's what they say. And uh, I, did, I was convicted of book making and went away to, uh, the United States penitentiary in Way, uh, Waymar, Pennsylvania, the U S penitentiary Canaan for uh, a straight bookmaking, straight sports betting, which like, you know, all over the country, it's, uh, it's pretty much legalized. It just legalized <laughs> yeah. in New York state over the weekend. I know, and, I know. Uh, Needless to say, where I'm from in Massachusetts, it's still not legal. So I'm I'm one of the only couple states left in the entire country that we haven't legalized it yet. Connecticut, which is right in my backyard, you know, three four miles away, is the the Enfield, Connecticut line, is um is legalized. You know, they have all the Benton Parlors and everything. And right now, Mass is uh, the last one, which will bring me uh, yeah. into the, uh, the the my little problem why I can't come on live, and I explain that after. But um. Yeah, but, 20, 20, I'm sorry, go ahead, Gary. Hey, hey check it out, Springfield, Massachusetts, correct? Springfield, Massachusetts, right? right? It, about uh, about an hour from Boston, right? 20 minutes from Hartford, Connecticut. We're, we're pretty centrally loca- located to everything, an hour from Albany, New York, two hours from New York City. So, so now, what I've read about Springfield is the patriarchal crime family has some uh, interest there, as well as Genovese family. Did you yeah, there's a, there's a few families that? out this way. There's a few families out this way, Gear. Uh, the patriarchs are the most dominant out of Providence and uh, Boston. Um, you, have, uh, you have the Genovese family, who's been for 70, 80 years out of, out of my little area, Springfield, Mass., Hartford, Connecticut, all the way down to the city, New York City. And um, you have some Gambinos too mixed in uh, through Connecticut too, down uh, down Stamford, down to New York City. So there's a couple families, and then uh, going all the way up into Albany, New York, it, uh, it's the Genovese. And then as you get further into like upstate Buffalo, and there, you know, they got the Buffalinos and different factions out there. But right. our predominant area is Genovese, where I'm from. Okay, interesting. So, and and we know if if there's uh, sports, at least in Kansas City, and I just have to assume it's there. Whoever the dominant family is, if you're going to take sports bets, they're going to be involved in some manner because you gotta you gotta be able to lay off, you gotta be able to balance your books. So, uh, Chicky, tell the tell the listeners a little bit about balancing the books and and you know what it means to be a bookie, how that money works. Well, when, when I, in, my, in my particular case, um, I was working, uh, the, the, the gentleman is no longer with us. He was uh, murdered on November 23rd, 2003. His name was Adolfo uh, Bruno, Big Al Bruno, Adolfo Big Al Bruno, right. who was a soldier uh, at a young age, 
with the Genovese family uh, out of New York City, but it was a, uh, they call it a satellite, uh, satellite, uh, uh, like a satellite unit in Springfield, which they've been for many, many, many years. And he later grow, rises up to become the boss. Uh, he's a captain. He becomes a boss of our area. And uh, I was under his, uh, I was under him. He was my mentor for a good 20 to 20, probably over 20 years, 25 years. And um, I essentially, I ran the day-to-day -day operations of uh, sports bookmaking for, for him, specifically him. And, uh, you know, I probably have a hundred, hundred, customers lay off to me on a, on a daily basis, seven days a week. And I probably have out of that hundred, probably about 30, 30, 40, uh, other bookmakers that were taking in big action. Um, you know, call me an edge off to me because they couldn't, okay. if, you know, if they were getting big numbers, they couldn't substand them themselves. So they would, they would edge off to me, you know what I mean? And, and keep what they could do. And then obviously edge off to myself. And then I would, uh, we, had, we edged off to nobody. We kept everything. That's just the way it worked with us. I was in the biggest office. And I did that for many, many years, took several pinches uh, for bookmaking, for uh, numbers, you know, stuff like that. Nothing, no violence. There was never no violence. Um, I was never, I mean, I wasn't the guy if uh, if you needed somebody to go, you know, crack somebody's head, it wasn't yeah. me. I wasn't that guy. I was a guy that was a very, very good racketeer, good with numbers, good with changing lines, good with uh, making moves with different lines. And uh, I was good at keeping track when... Uh, if we had too much money, just say like on the New England Patriots, if we had too much money after a certain amount of money, I would keep track. I would move the line by myself because you never want to get stuck with too much action with one line. You got to move the line a little bit, you know, to help you. And um, I did that for many, many years. And then, uh, like I said, in my area, some crazy things happened um, with uh, a lot of guys, a lot of, a lot of good people being uh, a lot of a certain really good guy got murdered. Um and I won't get into the specifics of that, but uh, and then we had a, uh, a we had a bunch of uh, defectors become informants mm -hmm. in our area and uh, go to New York and put a lot of people away in jail for life sentences. And um, I mean, I just kind of saw the writing on the wall, and I said, "Is this is this what it's coming to? Like, in other words, am I going to wait to face a twenty year or thirty year prison sentence in jail before I wake up and say?" You know, what am I going to do? Wait for my good friend or my best friend to put me away for life? Is that what it's going to come to? So um, after he was murdered, uh, after uh, my mentor was uh, murdered, which if anybody knows New England uh, organized crime, uh, Adolfo Abigail Bruno was basically like kind of like um, for our little area, like some, something like the John Gotti senior of our area. That's the other way I could probably put it. Very flashy cigars. Mm. was around his whole life a big money maker uh very very uh valuable to the family and uh you know i was around him like i said 20 25 years all the times he was in and out of jail i would take care of his affairs and uh you know i went away to a, a federal prison sentence like i said at usp canaan in waymar pennsylvania pennsylvania and when i got out i said you know what uh you know I'm going to either learn now or I'm going to be facing 30 years and then go have to do 30 years. And, uh, and I, and I pulled back and I, you know, I had a, you know, all the respect from everybody. And I, I, I pulled out with my head held high yeah. and uh, I started getting around other entities and other things, doing other things. And uh, like you said, you brought up the acting and I can get into that after, but uh, we got some good friends around us that were into the acting and uh, not so much acting, but they're producing a great shows and a lot of good shows are coming out. And uh, I was asked to be in a movie uh, shot in Queens, New York in 2019. And that's where it all started. Oh, interesting. Now let's, yep. I'm, I'm going to go back just a little bit. Uh, Absolutely. We'll talk about a, a myth or two that you see now. Now you, you were what we would call a connected guy. You knew people. I have, I have a friend here in Kansas city that is, was a connected guy. And he tells me about going into the kind of the different federal systems he spent. Yep. I think he spent 12 years in uh, several wow. different federal uh, camps here in Kansas city. And and right. so he was kind of the guy because he'd been there for a little bit after a while that if another guy from Kansas city who was connected ended up there, why well, he'd take him in and show him the ropes and everything and, and oh, hang out absolutely. with him. And he said, they all like, even he was in one where he had uh, uh, Tony Salerno and yep. uh, uh, a couple other guys like that were in, he said, they all hung out together. He yep. walked the track with a guy named Joe Butch Correo out of New yep. York. And that's so how it works. Th they formed a little group. So was that, is that how, how did that work for yeah. you? Yeah. Let me tell you exactly. Uh, 
it's crazy. It's like um, the Italians all stick together in federal prison a lot. Now, pri fe state prison, I, I haven't done a lot of time in state prison, only a couple of small stints in state prison. But most of the Italian, most of the organized crime guys are all in federal prison. And yeah. uh, I can give you like a little personal experience on me. Um, before I went to the USP Canaan, um, uh, they had me at the MCC Manhattan, which is a serious, serious joint. It's downtown Manhattan. It's in the Southern District of Manhattan. It's a, a federal holding. And um, um, I got brought in there and uh, I was on my way to USP Canaan. And I went in there. I was there for a couple months waiting for my bed to open up at uh, USP Canaan in Pennsylvania. And uh, as soon as I came in, I was on a, a floor called 11 South. It's a, it's a skyscraper. It's about 15 stories tall with the with the walking yard, half kind of like a half ass walking yard on the roof. Yeah. And basketball courts. It's on the roof of the building. And anybody can Google US uh, MCC Manhattan and it comes right up. It looks like it almost like an office building. Yeah. And uh, I was in my unit and a couple guys came up to me within the first, you know, I mean, it's, <laughs> they come right up. It's amazing how they know right away. They kind of feel you out where you're from, you know, they, they, they get in your ear a little bit. And then, uh, you know, within a couple phone calls later, they make a couple phone calls. They definitely check you out and it comes back. Yeah. This is this kid, blah, blah, blah. You know, if you're a good kid, if you're a, whatever you are, it comes right back. However you are in the street, if you're a funny kid, a good guy in the street, you're a good guy in there. If you're a punk yeah. in, the, in the street and a wise guy and a garbage on the street, you're a garbage in there. It follows you. Wherever you are on the street, you're not going to last too long them not knowing. They find out everything. It's amazing what they find out in there. And uh, this guy, uh, I'll give you a little uh, funny story. This guy befriends me in the MCC in Manhattan. I'm with him a couple of days. Guy at the time he's in his mid forties, good looking guy, you know, tan, really, really, uh, very, very uh, stands out in a crowd, unbelievable, right? Funny guy, took to me right away. It was he, he had the bunk right next to me, really good guy, and uh, got to know the guy. I'm with him for about a week. We're eating every night. We're we're having coffee, busting balls all day, you know, having fun during the day, laughing. I'm in with yeah. three, four good guys, and uh, <clears throat> at the time. I didn't know who he was. And uh, somebody comes up to me and they go, uh, Chicky, why does this guy like you so much? I mean, you know, people come in and out. He took to you right away. I go, I don't know. And come to find out, he goes, well, the guy told me, this other guy told me, he goes, that's the boss. I'm like, well, what boss? Boss of who? He goes, that's Vinny Gorgeous, Vinny Bashiano. Oh, oh really? <laughs> Vinny, yeah, he goes, that's Vinny Gorgeous. He was the boss at the time, the acting boss of the Bonanno family. Yeah. And at the time, I didn't know all this, but I guess Joe Mazzino was the boss of the Bonanno family and was on the roof of this MCC Manhattan with a wire from the FBI on and he had Vinny talking about things maybe he shouldn't have talked about Yeah, and it is what it is and Joe Mazzina is now uh, Vinny's doing two life sentences uh, I think he believe it now he's in Big Sandy he was in ADX in Colorado but now he's in Big Sandy and Joe Mazzina is laying on a beach in Florida uh, you know and, yeah. and he cooperated and put Vinny in for double life and he's laying on the beach probably in his 80s in Florida you know enjoying the sun Yeah, so there's an, another example of what I've seen, how if bosses are becoming uh, yeah, rats, really then, then what is that telling me? I'm not even in, in that caliper. What do you think's going to happen to me if bosses are turning on their underbosses? You know what I mean? Come on. So I, really I, mean, I, I was blessed. Enough. So I, I befriended him and uh, we were together a couple months. Very good, very good friends. You know, and, you know, and when you're with somebody, your friend will tell you when you're in federal prison. When you're with somebody, set 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know everything about them. It, it yeah. only could be for two months. It could be for 10 years. And whatever it is, you know everything about them. You know their wife. You know their kids. You know when they're coming to visit, when their kids are sick. Because they're there. They're in, the, they're in there when you're telling you everything, you know? Yeah. And uh, what a gentleman. I met, uh, I met another guy. Uh, he's an Albanian gangster from New York, from the Bronx. His name is Alex Rudai. And they had them back in the uh, – I was in the 2006, six seven. so – they had them as the corporation on the Bronx. They were the Albanian, the real Albanian gangster. I'm talking about serious guys. They had just got sentenced to uh, 38 years in prison uh, for extortion of the Gambino family. That was their charge. Extortion of the, <laughs> the Gambino, Gambino family. <laughs> Can you imagine that? And these guys, and anybody that's in the federal system, anybody that follows organized crime know these people. These guys were serious guys. Uh, Nicky Nails was this guy. Uh, uh, Lenny uh, Coletti was with them. I mean, all these guys, Angela Diapetro, these guys were, they had a crew out of the Bronx of the Italians and Albanians, mm -hmm. and it was Gambinos and Albanians came together and they made a powerhouse team where uh, at one point, FBI was going to call them the sixth family. That's how powerful these guys wow. were. So these are the guys you're meeting in 
these high level federal penitentiaries, especially this MCC in Manhattan. And like I said, MCC in Manhattan is just a holdover. Um, it's just you fighting a case until you plead guilty and then you go off to a federal penitentiary. So, um, yeah, so I got close with these guys and then really, really became friendly with them. And I'll never forget, I was only there about two months and they tell you, they told me to pack it up, you know, pack it up. And I, I was going on to the next location, which was USP Canaan. So uh, the morning that they came and got me, they came a couple of days before. And they said, come on, pack it up. I packed everything that they took it. I said, I told Vinny, I said, Vinny, I'm leaving. He goes, no, no, just because they got your stuff. It might be a couple of days. You don't leave the same day, you know, because they don't want the, they, the same day you leave. They don't tell you the exact day because for security reasons, yeah. right? Yeah. So, um, okay. So anyway, so anyways, uh, so they come to get me on a Monday and they take all my stuff. I don't leave till a Wednesday. So for 48 hours later, I don't leave. So I'm walking out. They finally wake me up five 30 in the morning. She could tell me it's, you know, it's time to, to go. Okay. So I, I, Vinny's next to me. He's right next to me in a, like an open birthing place, like in the jail. And I say, Vinny, I'm leaving. I, I shake him. I go, Vinny, I'm leaving. Thank you. He goes, no, no, I'll walk you out. So they start walking me out to, uh, they call it a, a sally port, which is like, uh, it's in between two locked places so they can keep you in there until they're ready to take you. Yeah. And uh, sure enough, uh, Vinny yells to this guy, Alex, who at the time is like literally legitimately the, gen uh, he's legitimately the Albanian godfather, they call him. This is what yeah. allegedly they call him. The guy was a serious guy. Gentleman of a guy. What a very nice guy. Great family. So anyways, uh, they, they both are walking me out to the sally port now. And, and Vinny says to me, Chicky, he goes, you know what? Now, this is after two months being with him. He's like, Chicky, I, I wish I knew you were on the street. I wish I knew you on the street. We laughed for two months. You, you know, you're just a funny guy. We had a lot of fun. I wish I knew you in the Bronx in the street. I would have had you around me. We could have laughed all day together. <laughs> and I said back to him, now he's the boss and I'm talking to him. And I said, no disrespect, Vinny. I said, but you're in here facing two death penalty cases. I'm yeah. only doing a small peanut bid for bookmaking. <laughs> I says, I'm glad I didn't know you on the street. <laughs> really? And he goes, you're right. Get the hell out of here. And uh, I said bye to him. And I said bye to Alex. And that was the last time I ever seen him. And uh, they're all over the internet. And, you know, and Alex just won a big appeal. And uh, like I said, uh, he, he's coming home in a couple of years. He was supposed to do 38 years. And I think they knocked like 15 years off his sentence. So he'll be coming home in a few years. So really? kudos to him. And Vinny, uh, I mean, anytime you see his picture on the internet, he's got a tan, he's smiling. Yeah. Talk about a guy who can do time. That's a real, right there's the last of the Mohegans right there. <laughs> yeah. And I wish nothing but the best to him. You know, like I said, I think he's going to be in for the rest of his life. But what a, what a true gentleman and honor to me to meet them guys. All right. So I'm going to ask you one last question, kind of about yeah. the mafia stuff, and then let's switch yeah. on over to the acting now. Uh, and, uh, anything. Kind of maybe uh, in in recent the recent past, a couple of names of a couple of brothers that that really hit the uh, the internet and the news big time were Freddie and Ty Gias. I, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Gias, yeah, Gias, G A S, yes. yeah, Gias, yeah. Uh, known them a long time. You know, good friends of mine. Uh, good friends grew up. They grew. I'm in, I'm in Springfield. They're in West Springfield. It's only 15 minutes away, right over okay. the water, right over Seneca River. Good guys. Uh, yeah, they, they got now, tied up in some yeah. crazy things. And when, uh, when I read about them, Chicky, was they were really, really badasses now. I, yeah. I, mean, I, I, I know I, I grew up in a small town and certain guys were badasses, you know. Yeah. They would no, kick your ass good. and they would yeah. kick it bad if you got yeah. a skew with them. Yeah. You know, were these guys really were, like that? Yeah, they were. And they, they were Greeks and weren't Italian, but that don't matter. Yeah. There's a lot of Irish kids from where we're from that are tough, tough kids, uh, especially out towards Boston, South Boston. Serious, serious kids, and these kids were Greeks. And uh, I grew up with them. Worked with Freddie. Uh, Ty was younger. Ty did a lot. Ty was his younger brother. Did a lot of time in jail, fed, in, in not federal, in federal now, but in state. Did a ton of time in state since he was 16 years old. Yeah. Tough, tough kids. Freddie, Freddie was more, more the brains of the operation, but tough, tough kid. And yeah, a matter of fact, they allegedly, uh, you know, you brought had brought it up on our pre-interview, but allegedly, allegedly, they got Freddie is killing Whitey Bulger. Which, like I said, that's allegedly, and I, and I just, if you don't mind me saying, they've had this poor kid locked up with another kid named uh, Johnny D. Colangero out of outside, right out. He, he's uh, Central Mass, right near Boston. Two yeah. kids. They've been locked up for three years in the hole, three years in Hazleton, West Virginia hole. They have not, the BOP has not charged them with anything yet. Let these guys either charge them or let them out. Let put them back on the uh, into population. Let let them live normal. Imagine three years in a hole like yeah. dogs, and they haven't even been charged of this. Yeah, it's sad. sad. It's very sad. And like I said, 
free Freddie and free uh, Johnny D. Calangero. It's a shame. Oh, I'm, I'm yeah. sorry, not Johnny. Pauly. I apologize. Pauly's, Johnny's his brother. Pauly. Pauly D. Calangero. Free them guys. Get them out of the shoe. Three years in the shoe and not even charged. And uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah. What, was, that, in- was that other guy? Is, it, is he in there for the same uh, being in the cell or somewhere watching out or something when, yeah, when yeah, Whitey was like killed? That. Okay. Well, I guess the cameras and the BOP cameras got them going into the cell, coming out of the cell five, okay. ten minutes later. Okay. And, and and all of a sudden, you know, who knows what happened? He, maybe he fell while he bulged it or accusing him of that. <laughs> yeah. who knows? Maybe he fell out of his wheelchair and banged his head. That's what I'm going with. That, yeah, oh, you know, that's what cops you always said. Well, he tripped and fell down the stairs. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But you know what I mean? If you're not going to charge somebody for three years. Right. Yeah, I understand you know, that. I, I mean, I, you know, do an investigation, but it don't take three years to do a, no. a, a investigation and be a BOP. Come on. Yeah. Right, that, I agree. You know, everything's right there. You don't have to go out and yeah. interview witnesses. You got it all right there. So charge, and just for the him, charge him or I wasn't go. in that jail at the time. They had split Freddie and t- <laughs> Freddie and Ty were together in a pre- federal prison, and they had a little altercation with somebody, nothing serious, and they split the two brothers up. So, so Ty's in California, I guess, and Freddie's in uh, West Virginia when that happened. So Ty wasn't nowhere near that prison when that happened. What he bought you just to make it, you know, make your to tell you, you know, to tell you that part of it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's let's swing into the acting and the and the the, the entertainment. Uh, uh, and we talked a little bit about this before. And and as I'm watching this, uh, as we talked about, like if you have an event like a mob con, we had a mob convention out in Las Vegas, and and the first year we got Frank Calabrese Jr. from Chicago and and another guy uh, uh, Andrew D. Donato from New York to come out who had written books. And, and we had a pretty good, uh, uh, you know, a pretty good attendance. And, and, but unless you have a big budget, you got to pay guys like that to come. Now, I went out on my own dime just to help the guy who was a friend of mine get that thing going. You gave a little talk about Kansas City, but people don't really want to hear from cops or agents, particularly. We're more like Phil, and they want to hear from you, mob guys, I, I'll tell you right now. And so, we're seeing that with Michael Francese and Sammy the Bull and and Bobby Luisi and uh, oh, uh, there's a I think Ari Oletta, uh, Jimmy Calran- Calandria. Uh, yeah. There's several names like that that are doing things, and and I'm watching their numbers on YouTube, and and particularly Francese and Sammy the Bull are making money. <laughs> they are making good money. They're having to pay money because it's it's produced, and you can tell they've got a whole crew helping them out with that but they're making money so i'm seeing this go in and now you're going into that now tell me about i guess how did you even get started okay yeah and what i wanted to say also about all these guys on youtube here's another thing you got to understand something and you know some of them guys you mentioned were at a big level in the organized crime some of them guys were on a lower level some guys were associates but you got to keep in mind most of the guys that are doing this now are and and it is what it is let's be honest all the way down the list they're 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 people that were in the life or around the life or associated with the life that became informants yeah. and now they and they say they're out they're doing it for a different reason they want to do the right thing they want to be good to you know they want to tell their story and they want to get away from that they don't want to get away from that this is the point i'm making and i'm 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 a nothing i'm just my my past is my past but i never was an informant i never would be a cooperator and that's why i got out of that business ahead of time this is what i don't understand these guys all want to change their life why don't they change their life prior to becoming informants why don't they change their life at the height of the game when they say you know what i see the direction this is going and it's crazy it's crazy let's get out now go out with your head held high yeah you know they come out and they have no other opportunity but to go on YouTube and yeah, they get incredible numbers because the majority of the world doesn't care about people who are informants. They really don't. Unless it affects them directly, they don't care about who's an informant or who's not. They want the story to be told of, of what they can hear. But if it's got something to do with their personal, like if something involved in their life where they put their brother away or their father away or put their sibling away, then they care. But that's what the problem is. And, and they're getting huge numbers. And, and, and you know what? That's that's welcome to 2022. Here's another perfect example of me telling you it's over. And whoever doesn't realize it's over, you know what? Then they're in for a sad awakening. They really are because, you know, you're going to end up on YouTube. You'll make money. And uh, but like I said, the people who are doing shows or are going to be doing shows that didn't cooperate, that want to start and change their lives ahead of time. You know, the, the, kudos to them guys. That's all I'm saying. Kudos yeah. to them guys. <laughs> here's here's what I'm waiting for is uh, uh, 
Francese or, or, or Gravano, one of them says, well, you know, he's cutting in on my territory. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pretty soon he puts, well, a hit, know, puts a hit out on another YouTube mob well, guy because he's cutting in on his territory, stealing yeah, some you, of his customers. <laughs> Gary, have you, yeah, well, don't, don't laugh. Have you seen these interviews with this uh, valuetainment? With yeah, David yeah, 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 I saw that. Had, okay, now, okay, so now they're having Sammy the Bull sit down with Michael Francese and yeah. Sammy the Bull, don't get me wrong. In Sammy the Bull's day, on the streets, he was a serious guy. There's no yeah. nobody's questioning his level of heightness. He was the real deal, hundred percent. Okay, but once you turn in your big card, your big street card, who I'm a nothing. Sammy the Bull was in a whole other stratosphere. But the bottom line is, what people don't understand is, once you trade in your your uh, your card of being a street tough guy, a gangster. And become an informant or a rat, whatever you want to call it. That card is taken. That card's taken. Now you're a YouTuber telling your story and you're like everyone else. Yeah. And, and that's what I'm saying. If you watch that show when they're going at it with each other, Sammy the Bull is, wants to jump over the table and attack Michael Francisi. Yeah. And, and, and has does he have it in him? Of course he does. He, he got forgiven for 19 murders by putting yeah. John Gotti Sr. away. Yeah. 19 murders. Uh, I mean, and he, you know, he could tell the story about how, um, John Gotti talked about him and was going to deceive him. And he can make up all the bullshit he wants. The bottom line is, how about the other 46 guys he put away? What did they do to him? You know, he didn't just put away John Gotti Sr. He put away 46 other guys from every family and across the board. What did them guys do to him? So yeah. you just got to take with a grain of salt. Uh, what these guys are changing their life. You know, they're, they're not changing their life because they want to do the right thing. They're changing their life because they have no other choice. Yeah. What are they going to do? They're, you know, they're going to open a business. They're going to open a job. What are they going to do? Yeah, yeah, so, you, you got, you know, a, point. That's, you got that's, a point there. It's it's really been interesting, you know. Out in uh, the guy that really started was a guy named Frank Culotta out yeah. in La Las Vegas. He was the first one, and, and yeah. he all of a sudden started making money, and they started figuring it out. And he and boy, it after that, it, it's just one after another. And here in the last year, I don't know how many there are on YouTube now. It, it's been and me, never mind. And you and Gary, never mind YouTube. There's guys connected, and I'm not going to mention names. But still that I know today that there's guys connected that actually have Instagram. Uh, they, they, you can go on Instagram and there's actual guys today. Some of them are even bosses and they have Instagram that, that if you, you know, you reach out to them, they'll, 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 they'll text you back. Yeah. I, I think Joey Merlino from uh, Philadelphia has a, a Instagram or some social media out there. A guy told me I never looked for it, but uh, yeah. Uh, uh, but there are some out there that do have that. You know, <laughs> yeah. so can you imagine? Can you imagine uh, uh, Lucky Luciano and these guys and, and, and Albert Anastasia and and uh, Carlo <laughs> you know, They must be turning over their grave, no? <laughs> oh, we've got one here in Kansas City. It, it's a little bit of a sad story. We had a guy when when back in the day who was an old school mobster named Willie Camasano. They called him Willie the Rat, and he was. Right. He was one of the most feared guys in Kansas City. He wasn't a, uh, he was a boss of a crew, but right. he, he was he was uh, so feared that the the real the boss Nick Savella didn't really keep him in too close. He you know he he was glad to take some money off of him, but he didn't associate with him very much because no. this guy was bad. So fast forward to today, he's got a son called Willie Camasano Jr. We used to call him Willie the Mouse, <laughs> and, right. but, he, but he was a bad dude too. He 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 was yeah. responsible for for some, some real crime that we never, nobody could ever make him on. He got COVID, he got long-term COVID and, and then he had a stroke in the middle of it. And now his kids are doing a, uh, uh, GoFundMe page, trying to raise money to help yeah. get, keep care, keep him in care. Cause he didn't have any insurance and you know, that it didn't really have that, you know, it spent all of his money and it was taken much more than he could ever save. So, uh, that's how much has changed in Kansas City going from yeah. The uh, that's all over the that's all over the country. The only the only place it's pretty much from what I'm reading and, and knowing people, I have uh, some people out there that talk to me once in a while. But in Italy, it's pretty. They got it down pretty good still. You know, in all the towns in Italy, they, the the, the, the Camorra and the and the Giornata and Giornata, they they all got it pretty. You know, they're pretty. They're still set pretty old time ways. And you know, they got their craziness too. But nothing like America. America's a whole other ball game. Yeah, it's uh. And like I said, in the, the, the message, the only message I'm spreading is, you know, why wait until you're facing life in prison? Why wait till you have to go to court? Uh, uh, you know, nobody's going with these new with these new uh, Giuliano, Giuliani uh, Rico laws. 
Yeah. You know, none of these guys are going away for 35. I mean, it was no. different before when you got 10 or 10 years, 12 years, a big sentence. You went and did 10 years. You were home. Them yeah. days are over. You yeah. get hit with that Rico. You're gone for 20, 30, 40 years. Yeah. No old timer, no matter how solid he was in his life, is is, is, giving, is is going away at 50 and staying his life in prison. It ain't happening, especially yeah. with the money they're worth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Back before the mandatory minimums, even, you know, they were getting 10, 12 years, but they do like three or four. Yeah. And be back. And home. as you know, you do 85 percent of federal time yeah. right now. Just, yeah. It's pretty bad now when you got bookmakers, uh, legit bookmakers. I mean, you got it's, it's it's completely legal everywhere in the country except for a couple of states. And you got guys still going away because of bookmaking, which, yeah. like I said, uh, I don't know if you know my case. I'll get into that later. But, you know, I'm getting sentenced March 17th and because of a, a straight bookmaking, no violence, um, you know, uh, on top of a small little nothing thing. And, and it, it, it could put you in jail for a couple yeah. of years. And you got yeah. guys that are doing extortions that are getting out in six months. So come on, <laughs> it, it don't take a, it don't take a brain surgeon to figure out what's going on and what they're doing, you know? Yeah. So let's so, talk about your acting. We, let, uh, I promise everybody <laughs> we're going to talk about your acting. Enough Absolutely. about crime. Let's talk about the, the good parts of your life, the acting part. Now, how okay. did you, how'd you get into that? And, and what's this well, movie uh, about that you're going to be? Okay. The, the, the movie I recently did was, uh, uh it's called uh, it's called Willie Pep, the Willie Pep movie about a boxer in Hartford, Connecticut. Willie Pep was around from the 1940s up to the 60s, 226 professional fights. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy's a legend in New England. And uh, the movie's about Pep, uh, him, Willie Pep, uh, a, a long Italian name. I couldn't even begin to say it. It's so crazy. And uh, but very, very long name. And uh, it the movie is produced by AP and Way which is a, a company owned and started by Leonardo DiCaprio. So he was the main guy on this show as far as funding it and, and producing it. And his company ran with it. And um, we shot it in Hartford, Connecticut. I, and, and the funny part about it is this is, this will be my third show I've been in, in two and a half years. Uh, we started off with a show in New York called the Flanagans, which is still uh, being produced. It, it ain't out yet, but if it does come out, it's an incredible organized crime drama shot in the Queens, New York. Mm -hmm. And um, what they tried to do is it started out back in 2019. They were looking for guys that were previously in the life, not actors, um, just guys that were in the life, did prison time and or that were out of the life that were looking to, to come in and play essentially uh, themselves, but in different uh, movie roles. Yeah. So that was my first uh, stint at acting. And I loved it. I mean, it, it was just, you know, basically we got a script and they were pretty much telling us, listen, if you don't think, and, and we would read the script and you got college kids writing these scripts. They don't, <laughs> yeah. they don't write so I would say, you sure you want me to say this? Wouldn't it sound better if I said this? And I would tell yeah. the guy and he'd say, oh my God, that does sound better. Say it that way. <laughs> yeah. So instead of having an advisor, like a lot of these movies have advisors on set, like when they played, when they did Irishman or Casino or these ones, right. they would have real ex-gangsters that would go on the set and say, no, that don't look right. Well, instead of doing that, this guy came up with the idea. Why don't we put all actors from another, some actors, but the majority of guys from the street that are out of that life that want to do something different with their life. So that's how we got started into it. And um, we went from there. And then uh, a friend of mine uh, uh, wrote a script, uh, uh, organized crime Irish drama called Hungry Hill, which they wrote it and uh, we got funded for it. And we're going to be shooting that probably this year. And and all in between, there was a couple of projects that came up. There's another project coming out. It's called Witsec Mafia. And it's uh, with John Gotti Jr., uh, Jr., John A. Gotti Jr. And uh, that's his project with Chris Casparosa. And um, what it is, is it, it's, it's, a, it's a documentary. Uh, but there's different, different series of it. Um, what they do is they talk about the uh, Witsec unit. How a lot of these uh, informants are putting guys away for life, and then they're going right back on the street, just like Sammy the Bull did. He yeah. got a sweetheart of all sweetheart deals, 19 murders, four years in jail, comes out. Then he goes away for 17, 18 years for running a, uh, a drug ecstasy ring with his family. Mm -hmm. So it exposes guys that the government handlers knew what they were doing, and they let them do it. And, and so they got on a new case, and that's going to be the show. So we, you know, we started off doing that, and a couple of my friends got roles in that. And they shot down in Miami. And that's what I was telling you. The kids saw you down at MobCon. Um, they went down to uh, to talk about the new Gotti 2 coming out with Armin Asante, which is, uh, I think it starts shooting next summer. Um, you know, this summer coming up or, or spring. Okay. Shooting that with Armin Asante. And uh, it's going to be shot in Marion, Illinois, at the prison out there. And uh, 
Armin Asante is playing the lead role again, you know, from for the new one. Right. And so, so we were getting around guys that were giving us the different direction. Listen, why don't you try acting? And we did a couple of things. And then this Willie Pep movie comes up last November, which uh, is a major motion picture. Like I said, you got uh, Leonardo DiCaprio involved. You got uh, uh, James Matteo played in Band of Brothers, played in uh, Hook with Robin Williams. Serious, serious guys involved. Yeah. Jay Gioni from uh, Los Angeles was in a ton of movies. These guys are real actors. And they wanted a part of the movie. Uh, I play, a, <laughs> of all things, I play a bookmaker for organized crime. That uh, was friends with Willie Pep. Willie Pep hung around with a lot of uh, organized crime guys in Hartford. And I'm like kind of like the bookmaker of the gym. And I hang around with Willie Pep. Everywhere Willie Pep goes uh, to fights, to uh, press conferences, I'm kind of the big guy that's with him that pals around with him, mm-hmm. that bust chops with him, but I got his back. And, uh, you know, he's been my, my lifelong friend. And that's basically, um, you know, where the movie goes. And uh, I had brought uh, a friend of mine there uh, named Brian Hoyo, who's a street guy, did 17 years in federal prison for extortion, uh, 12 years. You know, all, he's got 17 total in federal prison, knows everybody. He was part of the Irish guys, Irish crew in our area. And he came down to the set with me and he's got a real graspy, deep voice. Yeah. And uh, yeah. the director, he, you know, I said, I, this is my friend, Brian. Uh, and uh, I had another friend there who was a dear friend of mine and uh, he had COVID. So when he went in that morning, they were tested for COVID in November. They told him, you got to leave the set right away. So he ends up leaving the set. And my friend Brian's there. I said, well, this is my friend. I brought him in case you need an extra guy. <laughs> so as he opened his mouth, they said, we want him. Yeah. Because he has a real graspy, like, blah, 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 yeah. kind of voice like that. And he ends up getting the part with me. He's in the part playing, walking out the fighter to the ring. And uh, he says, but well, we actually had lead roles, talking roles in the movie. So it ain't going to oh, wow. be like you're passing the, the movie and you just see me sitting in the, in the, in the audience. I'm actually in a major scene with the, with the lead actor, James Matteo. And uh, he's actually talking to me and they, they even use my name in the movie. I'm like you would think they have a fake name yeah. and he turns around and he goes, chick. You know, yeah. because it, it could be any name. And, you know, he may, he goes, no, just use your own name. What do we got to use a fake name for? Really? And he t- turns around and he's in, in the, and it's a major scene and he's talking to me and he goes, hey, chick, what do you think? And I say a couple words, three, four words. And he punches me in the stomach. And we fool around a little bit. And then my friend Brian looks in and says, okay, gentlemen, it's time to make the walk. And he leads the fighter out to the ring for a big, big part of the movie. So it's like a major, major thing. And we were there, uh, it was three days. We were there two days shooting, but the, the, the main shoot day was one day, 12 hours. And um, it's the real deal. I mean, you show up, they got craft services, you know, full breakfast, lunch, and dinner there is waiting for you. They set it up. They got um, they got the, the big truck with all the costumes, uh, makeup. Uh, they I, had tat- I got tattoos. Unfortunately, I was in the military. I'm retired from the military. So I had a lot of tattoos on me from the Navy. They wanted them all covered up. So I'm in the, you know, I got a lot of pictures and videos of it. Uh, you know, they're covering up my tattoos, the, 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 you know, the, the professional makeup people. So what an experience, Gary. I mean, it, yeah. it's incredible. If I would have known this when I was 18 years old, <laughs> uh, I don't think I would have had this background of being uh, in trouble as a bookmaker. I think I would have been some, ma- who knows? I mean, <laughs> like I said, but I, but, I, but you know what, maybe I didn't get this now until now because of my experience, which that's definitely what it was. So yeah, everything well, works for a reason, but yeah, yeah you know what I, I like to say, everything's perfect just as it is. I, I, exactly. You, you want to change something, you don't know what you change. So we just, I agree with you. Everything's 100%. perfect just as it is, and I think I, think I agree you're with you. right where you need to be right now from what I've heard you say. And definitely, I and I could say, that. and I could say with my hell hell high, that hey, you know, yeah, I did change my life, but I changed it in a good direction, and I am doing things different. I am smarter. Thank God. But I'm not I'm not doing it as a person who ratted all my friends out. I'm not doing it as an informant that put all my friends in jail. And now I got to go on with my life because I got to choose to do something different. You know, I chose on my own free will to do something different. I didn't get forced to do something. different. Yeah, and that's the difference between. And um, as soon as my legal issues are over, um, you know, I'm going to do a YouTube channel. I, I did one several years ago about uh, about mob stuff. And I we did it in 2017. We were one of the first, believe it or not. I mean, it's, it's on the internet. Oh, I was one of the first. It? I'll look that up. Yeah, YouTube. I interviewed Chuck Zito. I interviewed Patrick Borriello, Bobby Borello. Some Bobby Borello was the hitman. John Gotti Sr.'s bodyguard. They got killed in front of his house. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we out of Brooklyn. Nice, nice family. I interviewed Patrick's a friend of mine, Borriello, his son. 
uh, who's now a man, has a baby, you know, uh, shout out to him and his family and beautiful family. And we're doing about all positive things. Uh, I'm around uh, good people. Like I said, uh, uh, John Gotti Jr. is doing a lot of positive things with uh, all his productions and, and stuff he's doing. And it's just honor. It's an honor to be around them guys and have them uh, point to the right direction. And that's what we're doing. We're doing all positive things. You know, he said many times, listen, he says, I still root for the bandit to get away. But at the end of the day, he says, uh, you know, if you're going to be into that craziness life, you know, <laughs> yeah. I don't, he said, they'll be around me. That's all. And, and, and you can't blame them. I mean, it's millions and millions, over $5 million in law, law bills, beating four, beating five federal cases. I mean, when they come through, they come strong. Yeah. So oh, I know him, beating, him, them, him beating them cases like that <laughs> four cases in a row. They came after him. Like, I'm talking about not 10 year cases, 20 year cases. He had lights out cases, death yeah. penalty cases, life in prison. And he beat every case. Now, if you beat all them cases, how can you expect a guy like that? Not to say enough's enough. I'm all set. Come on. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and he's a, he's a, he's a, I'll tell you the truth. He should be a hero to people. He really should in that lifestyle that you can get out without turning all your friends in and going and putting them in jail without being killed, without facing life sentence. He, he, you know, that's, that's the guy that people should look to and say, wow, you know, if this guy can get out at the top level and have, yeah. have, have his head held high and everybody respect him, you know, this is a guy I want to emulate, you know, emulate, you know, or be around or have good things happen. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I know what you're saying. It's, uh... so, it's a success story as far as that. And that's where I'm trying to, you know, I'm not going to, when I do my YouTube thing, I'm not going to go on bad mouthing people because I'm no better than anybody else. But um, I'm just going to go a different direction. And I think I'm going to do good. Like I said, I just got to get through some legal issues that are no big deal right now. Um, I just want to sew these things up. And then, like I said, when I come out, we can, uh, you know, definitely uh, reevaluate and, and go from there. But yeah. a lot of positive things happening, Gary. And so I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Good, good. Uh, it looks like you're, it sounds like you're going to have to do a little bit of time. Uh, probably not yeah. uh, a whole lot, but you're kind of no. sound like you're resigned to doing a little bit. You can do yep. that. So, as a guy told me once, I said he had some kind of a small case and I was a burglar detective. He said, man, he said, I can do a trace standing on my head. What, you know, go ahead, give me what you got. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And in federal, it's all how you take it. Like I said, uh, you know, you go, you go walk and you lose weight, you watch what you eat and you come out, you make a, you turn a bad and you turn a, a negative into a plus. I'll come out, yeah. you know, you lose weight, you feel good. You come out, maybe, you know, I'm writing a book. So it'll yeah, give me a lot I'm more good. time. Yeah. I'll give you a little tip on that. People love yeah. those. People love those prison stories too. They're, yeah. Yeah. And I got, I got, you know, thank so, God I didn't do a lot of time, but the time I did do, I got incredible stories for the, right, for the time right, I did right. do. Write those stories down and you got to go yeah. through time again. Why write those stories down and, and, exactly. and have them ready when you come out because people, you know, it's entertainment, man. You're, you're, getting, you're in the entertainment world right now. And, and yeah. you've got this, you know, this history, which people will pay money to, you know, hear about or see about or whatever. So, uh, uh, and I'll tell you the truth, uh, Gary, you'll be, you'll laugh, but even guys like in the movies, like different, uh, even some A-list stars, it's crazy because they're attracted to, Yeah, <laughs> they won't admit it, but when they meet you, they're like attracted to that other life. Like they yeah. know, you know, they're great actors and they got their thing going and they're, you know, we look up to them, how they act. Yeah. And uh, a lot of these big actors are attracted to that other lifestyle, like that they, that they portray themselves in, but yeah. they never were in, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just like, yeah. uh, I mean, look at, look at Sinatra and all these guys, they used to love meeting all the gangsters from all yeah. over the world country, you know, they yeah. used to they, everywhere in Chicago, New York, they were all over the place. They loved eating dinner with these guys and everything. Yeah. Uh, you said it. And I think you were quoting somebody else that I still root for the bandit to get away. And, yeah. and that's, yeah. that's, I love that saying, I'm going to have to use yeah. it. I'll, I'll give you credit a couple of times and it's mine, dude, but yeah. that's a great saying. I, I, we all still love it when the bandit gets away. We may not well, want to be what, the uh, bandit, but we love it. When John, the bandit that's what, that's what John Jr. Gotti. That's what John Jr. told me. Okay. He, I always, he goes, I, 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 I root for the bandits and still get away. But, uh, you know, but it is I ain't a bandit anymore. You no, know, the streets ain't the streets no more. And, and I respect him coming straight yeah. out and saying that. that's honorable. Yeah, it is. All right. So, well, Chicky, Chicky Telly from New England, from uh, uh, Springfield, Mass. Uh, 
former bookie with the Genovese family. Maybe he's not saying that out loud, which I don't. Well, I was maybe. convicted in jail for it, so <laughs> you I were guess convicted. You have to say uh, now. <laughs> that, that, that's what the prosecutor alleged. Uh, so yeah, exactly. we'll go with that. And I, and I did time for it. All <laughs> right, I got you. He's got a few legal problems coming up. I read about him online. We don't need to go. If you don't read about that, you can go run his name online. You'll find out perfect. a little bit. Uh, and, 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 and in your defense, Jackie, I want to say something. One thing is, is what you're saying. You took a felony conviction for bookmaking, which now is legal all over the country, but you're being charged with a crime because you have this felony. Now that don't seem right to me. Uh, no, I don't, well, and, and the last, the last state in Massachusetts, and uh, let me just give a shout out to my lawyer, Dan Hagen. He's with uh, he's Dan Hagen and Dan Kelly, two of the best uh, yeah. lawyers in New England. And uh, he's he's not only uh, my lawyer, he's uh, my counsel. He's my dear friend. And what he you know, what he's done for me and my family. Uh, I mean, I couldn't repay him if I wanted to, with, you know, any money in the world wouldn't repay him for what he's done. And uh, he's helped me so much with this case. And he's fought. We fought we were going to go to court with the case. But the bottom line is, um, you know. Uh, you can go people just to give you a little rough estimate. Uh, they were serving a federal warrant to somebody in my family and, uh, they came in and they did a, they did a search of the house and they found, uh, they found a legal ammunition and a gun and, um, and they charged me being a convicted felon, which like right. I said, the only cases I ever had was the, uh, was the, uh, sports book making no violence and, uh, and it's legal everywhere else. And if I didn't have that conviction, um, they wouldn't be able to charge me with that. You know, yeah. it was all legal. It wasn't a stolen gun. It wasn't used. It wasn't fired. But they, they so in federal, they can't unless if the gun had traveled outside state lines, they can charge you with the gun. But because it was a Smith and Wesson, and Smith and Wesson is in Springfield, Massachusetts. Oh yeah. They can't, federal's feds cannot charge you with a gun. They charge you for the ammunition only. Oh wow. So essentially, uh, just for having a couple bullets, I'm gonna have to go to jail probably. Uh, probably somewhere between 10 and 18 months. Okay. And just because I have a conviction 15 years ago, and never been in trouble since, but just because I've had a conviction 15 years again ago for um, no violence, just a straight bookmaking beef. And to be honest with you, my lawyer had told me, and I didn't even know this, that I was the last case in all of New England, all the way up through New York, all the way to Boston. Um, I was the last convicted bookmaker with no violence to go to <laughs> federal prison to get federal prison yeah. time i know it's crazy so, the marijuana crazy. The, the marijuana convictions are the same way there's a lot of people yeah. doing a lot of time that crazy you know, for something that's legal i know it's crazy uh, uh, the law does not keep up with society many times or with technology and, and that's so you know you know what i was going to say here if you don't mind me saying this you know the government and i mean i can my who am i to say anything they ain't gonna listen to me but <laughs> Instead of worrying about the bookmakers with no violence, and I know there's violent guys out there that got to take off the street. That's understandable and everything. Yeah. And instead of worrying about these marijuana, all these crazy people are in jail right now for huge sentences for marijuana. You know what? Why don't you tr tr throw the book? At, I can understand the fentanyl epidemic we're in. The, 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 uh, you know, the, the fentanyl and all that fentanyl, is killing yeah. people. And it's just yeah. ravaging our world, our country, everywhere, our world. Yeah. What, you know, key on them. Key on these, uh, key on these, uh, these guys that are hurting kids, the child molesters that are getting let, let out of prison after 12 months in prison and, and, and have to walk around with uh where they can't go near schools. Now, if you got to have a, if you got to have, and I've read so many times over the internet, if you have to have a guy that you have to have wear a monitor, a body monitor, where if he goes near a school, yeah. he's going to get arrested. If you're going to let him out and have to put that on him, should that guy be out of prison? <laughs> really? I agree. I mean, yeah. come on. Are you I kidding know. me? Yeah. So that, I just think we should, okay. uh, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, it is. And life is not always fair as we, we all, we know that uh, the best thing I can do is accept that life is not always fair. <laughs> if I, I were king. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Chicky Chickatelli. You know, I really appreciate you coming on. Chickie. Thank this you. Jay. I appreciate all it. Right. Thank you audience for listening. I hope they found some of it was okay. Just telling the truth. And all right. again, Gary, thank you for the time. And I appreciate it. We'll do this again anytime. All right. Good, Chicky. Good to see, talk to you. All right. Take care. Have a great okay. uh, new year, okay? Okay. All right. Well, folks, that ends a, another Gangland Wire episode. I uh, really appreciate you tuning in and listening, however you listen to it, whether it's on the website or on one of the apps. I, I also want to express my thanks and sincere appreciation for the kind reviews that you've given me uh, 
on the app or the Apple app or, or some of the other podcast apps. I don't check them. I used to check them when I first did this. I checked them a lot, but I don't check them anymore so much. Once in a while, I look at them. Uh, sometimes I get, you know, sometimes I get my feelings hurt, especially on YouTube, but that's okay. Uh, if you put yourself out there, you, you better not have a thin skin. I've learned that. Uh, you know, my most recent documentary, I really want to express uh, uh, extra appreciation to the people that stepped up and helped me finance that movie and, and able to increase the production values, uh, hired a professional to do the reenactment scenes and some of the other things and got some better music I had to pay for. And we have it out now. Now, the last time I did one of these endings for the uh, uh, podcast, I, I had a different title. I changed the title just at the last minute. It's now about theft, burglary, murder, and cover up. So I encourage you to come on the website. I can't get it on Amazon like I have Brothers Against Brothers and Gangland Wire because they changed their rules. And if I can't get a theatrical release like a major film studio or get it in a major film festival, which is kind of like, uh, uh, I don't know what it's like. It's, it's, it's dang near impossible unless you're politically connected to some of the people that run these film festivals. And a guy like me uh, doesn't really have a chance. It's been my experience. I fought that a few years back and, and I gave up. It's, it's too much effort for uh, too little payoff. Uh, but if you want to stream it, it's on my website for $1.99. I figured out a way to do that. And uh, you, you, you pay me $1.99 and I will send you a link to stream it. As well as my other two movies, you want to stream them for $1.99. Of course, I have the DVDs for sale. Or if you make a donation, why uh, I'll give you the DVD and give you a streaming uh, link too or a book or Kindle book, whatever you want. You, know, you guys kind of know the drill by now if you've been listening to it. If not, just go to my donate page. I uh, uh, One last thing, I've kind of uh, dogged off on this PTSD thing. I used to always uh, uh, want to try to promote that. So uh, if you've been listening to podcasts, you know what to do. But uh, if you have any problems with PTSD and you know, and you're a veteran, then you know, go to the VA. If not, go to the VA website or just Google VA hospital PTSD and they've got a hotline and they've got a lot of resources. And even if you're not a veteran or if you just know a veteran, you can, you can go there and find the resources. If you're not a veteran, you can go there and find resources. Music provided by our good friend and super fan from Portland, Oregon, Casey McBride. Thanks, Casey.